The Bonneville Shoreline Trail has been under construction for 30 years. Join me, Brandon Plew, and my son Spencer as we hike the 200 mile length of the BST to learn about its past, present, and future, and explore the landscape of this boundary between the city and the wilderness. On this episode, we begin our hike at the Spanish Fork Reservoir and Gun Club. We'll cross the mouth of Spanish Fork Canyon and on through Mapleton. There's actually a really nice trail just down there, kind of around the hill that goes a couple miles through mostly public land. But to get there, we would have to cut through all this very dense brush on city and state land to get to that trail. I've done it before. It's not much fun, so we'll just start here and head that way. Most people driving by don't even notice that there's actually a reservoir up here on the side of the hill. This provides our pressurized irrigation water in the city. They pump water up from wells down in town and then it's gravity fed back out. It's, uh, as you can see, a very popular lake. It's got its own little beach there and during the summer that'll be totally packed with people all over this lake fishing and swimming and it's like some boating too. For the past several years, Spanish Fork City has been really good about building this really nice network of trails for mountain biking and hiking. None of it's been actually designated as the Bonneville Shoreline Trail yet. There's not much point in that until we actually get a fairly lengthy segment put together. So right now we're kind of finding our way through this maze. Last year, Spanish Fork opened this mountain bike downhill run there's actually three runs up here on the mountain that they've built. They built it using recreation tax money, the wrap tax that's, that Utah has, and they've been very popular ever since. It's a pretty wide expanse here of the Lake Bonneville bench. The canal company that owns this uh, section of land here, I think had some plans to want to build houses up here. It's certainly buildable, but uh, getting to it with utilities and roads would be a major nightmare and I think the city has actually told them to forget about it. So I think there's actually a decent chance we might be able to convince them at some point to just keep this all as open space because I really like it up here. Drivers passing up the highway into this canyon on their way to Moab or Denver or wherever often notice this cross up on this prominent hill here. It seems a little out of place. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, while Christian, doesn't have a lot of cross imagery. I wonder why it's here. Well, it was put up here just after 1976 to commemorate the bicentennial, not of American Revolution, but of the first white people to view the valley here. In 1776, Fathers Atanasio Dominguez and Silvestre Velez de Escalante that's Escalante to you and me in Utah. We're trying to find a route from the colonies and missions in New Mexico, where they had already been for almost 200 years, to the recently established missions in California. One of their guides, Silvestre, was a Timpanogos Ute who kept talking up this great valley where he grew up that was by the side of this big lake. On September 23rd, they came down the canyon of the river they called the Rio de Aguas Calientes because of the many hot springs they found there, which was later called the Spanish Fork River in their honor. Climbed this surprisingly steep hill and first beheld this magnificent valley. The Timpanagotsis were out there by the shoreline of the lake. So they went down there and spent several days with them. Silvestre was reunited with his family, decided to stay behind and they turned around and went back to New Mexico. It wasn't for many years later before they eventually had a permanent road to California. You don't realize how big these things are when you drive past them on the highway, They're huge. The Wasatch Front is blessed with some world-class, magnificent canyons. Places where you feel like you're in the Alps or something. Spanish Fork, on the other hand, well, it's kind of more of a working-class canyon. You have to appreciate its beauty 
in between the railroad and the highway and the power lines and the canal. I still like it though. Having the Bonneville Shoreline Trail cross this section, it's gonna be a challenge. I can see over there, there's a tunnel that goes under the road where a branch railroad used to go up in there, but you'd still have to cross the railroad. Until then, we're gonna have to just go back, get in the car, and drive over there to get to the next section. The next day, it was apparent that the hike was about to get harder, as the windmills were spinning noticeably faster. The only way to get up onto the Bonneville bench that uh, we can find is, uh, is to go up these old utility access tracks. So we've got to get up to those higher poles up there. It's going to be a bit of a climb on some really steep roads, but uh, we'll give it a shot. I was talking to the planners for Spanish Fork and Mapleton, and they kind of shared me what the plan is here. Both cities have uh, paved trails down lower, as well as the Bonneville Shoreline Trail up at this level. If we start at the Spanish Fork River there, is to bring that trail up the river behind that warehouse and the Bonneville Shoreline Trail to meet it there, bridge over the railroad, go through that tunnel that we saw and the Bonneville Shoreline Trail will switch back up this much nicer slope up there that you can see uh, up to this level. So that's the current plan. It's, uh, they're actually talking about starting to do the paved part maybe next year. So they're working on the, on the exact route right now. So that part's gonna be sooner. Hopefully at some point we'll get a nice uh, route here. The other day, the kind of lagoon area that we were looking at, that depression, is uh, right there below the cross. And that got me thinking as, I, as we were looking at that, that I want to talk to somebody that knows a little bit more about Lake Bonneville than I do. And I figured if I was going to talk to somebody, I may as well talk to somebody who knows more about the trail than anybody else I know. So we're going to do this virtually today. So with me is Dr. Jack Oviet. Jack was just recently retired. He was a professor of, is it geology, Jack? Yes, it was geology. Okay. A professor of geology at Kansas State. He's now in New Mexico, so he couldn't join us out here on the trail. So there's uh, kind of getting a view there of the bench up there. Yeah. Spanish Fork here has one of the larger, I think, benches at this higher level. So this is probably a good place to talk about this. Tell us a little bit about Lake Bonneville itself. Like what, what is it that made this gigantic lake? Well, it's, uh, it's a combination of tectonics and climate. As the Earth's crust was being pulled apart, it broke up into a series of, of basins. In other words, the tectonics created the hole that could be filled with water. With no drainage outside. That's right. It's only when the lake got big enough that it could flood over into the Snake River drainage. And that didn't happen except for once that we know of. But the rest of the time, it was just a it was a basin that was uh, collecting water that came in off the mountains in the rivers, which are draining the Wasatch and Uinta Mountains, which were heavily glaciated in, in the late Pleistocene. So right now it's dry and warm, so the Great Salt Lake is pretty low. But if the climate were to change and we go back into a glaciation, then the lake would come back. So it must have been really wet during the during the Pleistocene then. As far as we know, it was, yeah. There were spruce trees down at the level where you are standing right now. Holy cow. <laughs> that's hard to imagine all this sagebrush. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's how, that happened multiple times, didn't it? That the lake got this big, kind of as the Ice Age came and went? During the last 800,000 years, there were only four major lakes, and Lake Bonneville was one of them. So yeah, it, it did go up and down, but it never got as big as, as it did during the Bonneville lake cycle. I think I, I heard there were times when the lake actually dried up completely, didn't it? Well, it probably never dried up completely, but it got very low, even lower than modern Great Salt Lake. There would have been uh, marshes and you know wetlands out on what is now the bed of Great Salt Lake. How long was Lake Bonneville at this highest level? Well, uh, probably just a very short time, but it took from around 30,000 years ago to around 18,000 years ago to get all the way up to the top. So it started out around 30,000 years ago down at the level of Great Salt Lake, and in 12,000 years, 
it worked its way all the way up to where you are now. Let's talk a little bit about kind of the, what we're seeing here. Well, that, that bench that we're looking at off in the distance there is the remnant of the delta of Spanish Fork River. You know, Spanish Fork, the, the stream itself is down cut and eroded a lot of the material away. And all that's left is a little bit there on the bench. So a lot of the sediment that we see here wasn't deposited at that highest level. It was deposited very gradually as it came up to the highest level. That's correct, yes. Tell us a little bit more about what happened when it got to that highest level, how long it was there. Let's say that's an alluvial fan at Red Rock Pass, a fan-shaped landform composed of stream deposits, basically. So not very solid stuff. It's not very solid stuff. That was what was holding Lake Bonneville in. The lake was gradually rising through time until it got up to the, the crest of the alluvial fan and it started spilling over this very weakened dam and it washed out catastrophically. And that's what's called the Bonneville flood. I can't imagine what the Snake River was like at that time. Yeah. I mean, it was full of water. It was the biggest flood ever recorded on Earth. It released something like a million cubic meters per second. That dropped lake level from the Bonneville shoreline all the way down over 300 feet to a more stable threshold. Then it lingered there. It continued to overflow at that more stable level for way over a thousand years, maybe as long as 3,000. And that's what we call the Provo level, right? That's the Provo shoreline, yeah, right. So a lot of that sediment was deposited on the way up, but then kind of the top layer was deposited at that stable lake level. You mean the Provo component of the deltas? Yeah. I'll be below the Provo shoreline, of course, and out at the sort of the mouths of the rivers at, where they had cut into their older deltas. Okay, so that's kind of out at the end. It's kind of being dumped off the end of the delta. Yeah. In the over 350 feet of drop, the river's really entrenched into those transgressive phase deltas, and all that sediment that had been in the delta was being washed out into the Provo Lake. Well, Jack, uh, thank you so much. This has been very educational to, to kind of understand how all this works. Okay. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you later. All right. Thank you. We're now 100 feet or so above the actual Bonneville shoreline level. So you can see that how it's all flat right there. That's also part of that Bonneville level delta at the same elevation as across the canyon there. So you can imagine as Jack was talking about how all of that, the river has since washed out. And at one time, this would have been like a delta, a big circular arc here, all covered up with, uh, with sediment that's all eroded away. There's a plan to build a big housing development. They're talking about hundreds of houses here in Maple and you can see way up there at the edges, it's just starting to kind of make its way this way. So the first phases now of all of this development is happening, but you know, we could argue about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But one of the nice things about it is that they all, Mapleton made sure that they had plans for the Bonneville Shoreline Trail to be put in here as part of that. So all of this oak brush down here uh, is where the, is, will all be left natural. In fact, this upper bench area here uh, has a much lower density. So this will be a much more natural area. One of the unique things about our hike today is that almost all of the trail that we're on is owned by Mapleton City, not by the Forest Service or private landowners or anything like that. That's the result of a unique policy that Mapleton has had for many years called the Transfer of Development Rights. Mapleton enacted their first TDR ordinance back in 1996. Several other cities since then have enacted TDR ordinances and are using this policy, but Mapleton's probably been more successful at it than just about anybody. Let's say you're a property owner and you have some, some property out in the valley and some property up here where Mapleton has said, we'd like to preserve all of this area up here. What you can do is you can donate your property to, to Mapleton City. So essentially you, you lose the development rights for this property. And in exchange, Mapleton City allows you to have higher density down in the valley. Mapleton City has mostly agricultural land down there. So now they can, they can actually develop the property down there in regular kind of suburban densities. But Mapleton ends up with a huge amount of property up here in the foothills. The net result of that is, unlike a lot of other places that we'll be hiking through, the trail itself that we're on here is pretty much ready to go and has been for 20 years. Today, we could just designate this as official BST 
The problem is access. This surprisingly well-built gravel road here is probably gonna be the first major access point up to this shoreline trail here. It was the utility for the water line going down to those new subdivisions that you can see being built at the bottom of the hill there. It's mostly owned by Mapleton City already, even though the houses, there will eventually be houses all the way up to here, but that's a while off, but the city can now already have a legal access. There's one stretch of the subdivision that's still under construction that is gated off, but the gate says foot traffic is allowed. So probably by this summer, I'm thinking we'll actually be able to come up here and reach this section of the trail. That looks like this is the end of the trail here. It's too bad too. We got a nice level trail continuing on there. And just barely around the corner of the hill there is a really nice Forest Service trailhead. In fact, because of that, uh, for decades, this trail has been used heavily by hikers and horses and bikes and, and ATVs and whatnot. Back in 2000, when there was a big push all across the Wasatch Front to designate as much of the Bonneville Shoreline Trail as possible, Mapleton City thought, well, we got it easy. This is a piece of cake. Trail's already here, trailhead's already here. We're done. So they asked the person who owns this property, hey, can we have permission to designate official trail across this property you don't, you're not using? The person in response to that said, no, I've got some really nice property here. I believe I can develop this at some point. I'm not ready yet, but I'll develop it at some point here. They eventually would try to come to some agreements and then the agreements would fall through. I was talking to the Mapleton city planner. It sounds like they're really close to having an agreement now that will allow a certain number of lots to be developed up here as well as a, a corridor for the trail. Although it may be a while before the development, the phases actually come up this far and we actually get a, a full access. So fingers crossed, we may be close to a resolution. So this is probably the second most possible section of access trail to get up to the BST. And there's actually a pretty nice trail weaving its way down here. I think it's been used by mountain bikers or something. It's all pro public property. The city owns kind of a, a 30 foot wide corridor here so they could pretty easily put in this trail. It's got one problem though. It has to drop off this cliff. <laughs> The remainder of our stretch lies on the other side of the private property, so we went around it to finish up on the next day. So you can see kind of behind us there, there's the fenced off a section. That's the section that's still being developed. So the plan is that the trail now will go down around the bench and eventually connect up with where we were before. You can see what a mess this is right here. This used to actually be a pretty nice trail. But then last fall, there was a big fire up here on Ether Peak above us, and the Forest Service had to come in and plow all this to make a fire break. They don't want it to turn into a road and encourage motor vehicles up in here. So they always come in afterwards and plow it all up and, and uh, chew it up and then throw the brush back on top of it. A good practice except the trail that we were used to use for bikes and, and hiking is now a big mess. My daughter and I came up here last month and it, we had to give up because it was just a big mud bog. It looks a little better now, but it's still kind of muddy. So we'll see how, it, see how it goes. You were filming back there just because you were hoping I would like slip and dive into the mud, weren't you? Or get a witness when I slip. <laughs> Well, clearly we are at the end of the trail here. The, uh, we've been on Forest Service property this whole time today, uh, but this is where that ends and the private property begins. You can see that the bench continues really nicely there out around the point of that hill to Springville, but they've made it pretty clear, both in talking to the city and in uh, obviously by the fence here, that they don't plan to allow public access anytime soon. Since this is a dead end trail, Mapleton's had to figure out a, a uh, alternative plan for the time being, near future, 
So they're gonna start up there where the trailhead is where we started today. And uh, you can see here is that trailhead and this red line is the trail that we've done today and there's the dead end. Orange is where the trail could go eventually, but it's not now. So their plan is here to actually go down along the roads. So that subdivision there that's going in has a plan to put a paved trail along the road. Down here in the flat, there's a plan for a subdivision. It will also have a paved path. That new subdivision there already has a paved path along the road. So basically connect up on the roads through the subdivisions all the way uh, into Springville. So it's not ideal. It's not what people would like to have. Yeah, that's kind of what we have to have to do sometimes is make something that's gonna work. Well, what's the verdict on that stretch? It's a real pretty woodland. I like that. The trail itself was a complete disaster area, I guess literally, and the dead end. So I guess we'll uh, call it a wrap for this episode. And next episode, we'll be over there in Springville.